So next up, we have Chris Healer. He's the founder and CEO of The Molecule. He'll talk about the ins and outs of stitching, rendering, and visual effects. Uh, and it, most recently, he's been working on Doug Lyman's Invisible, which is the first episodic action-adventure series created uh, for immersive virtual reality. So, Chris? So, I, it helps me, actually, if, if the audience asks questions and I, and I get some, some interaction. That's just my style of doing things. I don't exactly have a, a curated presentation like the others, especially about um, uh, the work with, with Doug on Invisible, because we just shot the first third of it about a month ago, and we're still processing footage and putting an edit together and trying to learn how, how to make this, this language work. Um, um, I mean, and just while we're all here, like, congratulations to MPC and, and the mill. Like, this is truly an accomplishment, what we've seen. Um, and just stunning resources, like, amazing. Uh, we're coming at it from kind of the opposite direction and trying to, to, to bridge it in a different way because, uh, you know, one of the big problems that we're dealing with is, is that we're shooting, the goal is to make a uh, Five, well, six five-minute-long episodes that have action, visual effects, multiple locations. We're underwater. We're in the air. There's car chases. There's obviously an invisible man. So, um, so one of the big things is how how do you cover the time, like just on a budgetary standpoint, and and how do you make an edit work when it's a lot of dialogue, right? And it's not always action. You need to get some story out there. So. Um, so from my point of view, because we're also dealing with a, a lot of other types of visual, uh, VR works and visual effects for VR. So it, um, and obviously I'm a shop owner. So coming at it from, from, from my perspective, it's some of it's VR, some of it's gadgets that are in new, some of it's, some of it's just simply, uh, conceiving the proportions of work differently because it may be that, you know, just like any other shoot, if, if you're, shooting a TV show, for instance, you probably shoot 30 or 40 to 1 uh, as a shooting ratio, but in VR, you've got, it may easily be, and depending on how you calculate it, you know, two or 300 to 1, depending on how you count individual cameras, depending on how you count uh, very long heads and tails while cameras rolling, double check the cameras, slate the cameras, make sure audio, walk away, roll for 15 seconds, get everybody back in, cut, so you don't have you end up with a tremendously huge quantity of footage compared to what actually makes the edit. Um, simultaneously, you also have obviously very long shots because the the language of post production hasn't fully been developed yet for VR. It's not as simple as um, you know, cut, 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 cut to exterior, get an establishing shot, cut back in. Uh, I mean, for instance, we've done a lot of rewriting after the fact for for Invisible because we want to get we want to get the storyline across properly, and we won't want it to be forced, and we don't want to kind of uh, you know have an arrow that says here you need to look at this here or here this is you know I mean even the question of like basic lower thirds and subtitles are not quite so simple. So for instance, there was a scene. Uh, I'm going to show you some stuff, but it's probably not quite as visual as we would like because it's, I'm, I want to speak as here we are, a society, and let's talk about some ideas for how things are being produced. I can only show a very little bit of the show itself. In fact, just one frame is all I'm going to show. We're going to step through some other <laughs> examples. Um, but one, one interesting thing was that we have uh, in the show, there's a family. It's a very wealthy family. They're trying to schedule a conference call together. So... Uh, so this is a very interesting idea. How do you get a conference call in VR space? That's interesting, right? Because when I'm on Skype, I might have a tile of nine images and I'm looking there, but are we really using the space, right? Are we really using VR to its potential or are we in some, you know, office room? Am I seeing this corner right here behind me and uh, just in front of me is a conference call? So, so one direction we're looking at uh, is what we're calling the the kind of orange peel approach or the tangerine approach, which actually ends up being, here's a bunch of panels and you're kind of sitting in the middle of this conversation and uh, how do you get those panels onto the screen? How do you get them off? 
What's their purpose? Can you do cuts in between? Um, and if you, you know, in VR or in Nuke at least, you know, you do a lot of projection onto spheres and, and manipulating things in that way. And when you run nine slices and look out at a sphere, it looks like a like an orange that's been cut. So that's been kind of our our nomenclature. Um, <coughs> but ironically, see this is. I find it interesting the language that that at least we internally are forming around uh, post-production and storytelling because we have this other notion that we use called called the hot tub, right? So it says uh, if you're gonna if you're gonna film a hot tub in VR, do you want to sit on the edge of the hot tub and watch the action, or do you want to sit in the middle of the hot tub and have it happen all around you? Uh, I mean, and this is kind of a a philosophical question of like where do you put the story are you allowed to put story behind you or is it just perhaps something interesting is happening behind you but you're not necessarily obligated to look at it in order for the rest of the show to make sense right because regardless if there's 3d 360 degree image around us we can really only look in one direction at a time um so in terms of the conference call we're going to sit in the middle of the hot tub but it may be that if we're doing it at a conference table, you want to sit at the edge of the conference table and watch the conversation. So, um, so let me just pull up some of these and just step through and see, um, you know, basic lat longs, lots of different projects, and we're, you know, I, I mean, just it may be, I don't know if it's my personal vision, uh, you know, uh, thing, but it is kind of the situation we're in is like, on the one hand, to make one perfect second of VR, that's one goal. But on the other hand, it's like, and I don't want to do anything that's quote unquote good enough. I want it to be great. But sometimes it's like generating an hour of material at 4K at 60 frames per second that comes from 17 or 24 cameras. Uh, all of a sudden, from a budgeting perspective, you've got, you've got a serious problem, right? <laughs> because about, at least in my conception, um, you know, with the features and TV and commercials that, that we work with, it's like, okay, footage comes in. It came from one camera. An editor looked at it. They know that they want that shot. They put handles on it. Great. We give it to a producer or an editor who eventually, you know, go, it goes through our process and then it ends up going to our comp supervisors and eventually lands at an artist, right? And that's our normal workflow. And then you work on the shot and you deliver it. So here's a little startup time. Here's a little delivery time. And in the middle... An artist does his thing. But what we're finding in VR, for instance, is of the total project, here's a day to copy a terabyte of material, and then a couple of days to just to do a, a basic preliminary stitch, and then you deliver that to the editor to get that cut down, uh, bring it in, actually go back, and, and instead of, I mean, I don't know if anyone loves auto pano color. It's, is it? <laughs> It works. It's good. I mean, it does what it does. But once you exceed the boundaries of what it can do, it can it can really be uh, hard to deal with. So so once the editor has made, you know, we're doing a daily stitch in, in color, for instance, editor makes his choice or her choice, which is going to be a, a cut down plus handles. Then we have to unravel from there. So on my progress bar here, right, I'm still only like a third of the way in where now now my assistant editor is pulling up an, a, a PTO file from, from color, for instance, and then re-emulating the sync, the sync points in Nuke, making sure all the footage is linked, named properly, sitting in the right place, actually reads, right? Then just a preliminary, because we're still pulling from, from color, okay, now we have like something like a step one for an artist. So, so instead of it being here's a little startup and here's a little finish and some VFX work in between. Now we're already like a third to halfway through looking at time or budget. We're that far in and we haven't even done anything yet, right? And then sometimes, um, and I was actually talking to Jason about this, uh, sometimes what's interesting is that, that stitching is visual effects, right? It's just a different weird form of it where you're pulling lots of cameras and you're rendering lots of frames, but there may not actually be an effect of any kind to speak of. Um, uh, so in our workflow now on our giant progress bar, you've got, okay, now we need to get a stitch that's good enough or hopefully perfect that we're going to approve and we're going to say this thing we're going to commit to, anything else that's fun to, you know, the fundamentals are out of the way. Anything else is just roto and paint on top, you know, little ghosting things or whatever. But 
all the lines that are supposed to be straight, those are straight. Top and bottom, that's working. We've painted out the tripod, we've got all that stuff. See, now here we're somewhere in the half to, to two thirds realm of, of the process of just one shot. Um, then obviously, so let me, just got lots of examples of, I didn't know quite how this conversation was gonna go, so I brought in lots of examples of uh, absolutely non-rectilinear geometries and how we actually dealt with we're stitching those things. Um, well, I'm also going to talk in a second about this some some work we did for Gone VR, which has been very popular. Um, I mean, how many of you are, are business owners versus artists versus producers? Like, not business owners, but but working on a management side instead of the artist side. That that would be interesting for me to know. Management, okay, and then artists, okay. Cool. So this this is one shot uh, from Invisible, and this is this is basically the first time that we're seeing our Invisible Man. That was a joke. Um, <laughs> if you look in the middle, you'll see these faint outlines. As it, as he moves, it's actually a really cool effect that is kind of a a watery ripple, which again contributes to our kind of nomenclature, uh, which we of course call the Predator effect because that's basically what it is. Um, but, you know, updated by what, 25 years now. So, um, so that's been a really interesting process in post because, um, so I'm, I'm VFX supervising on set for this. We have a VR supervisor also. Um, it's a little unclear how those two roles separate at times. Invisible is different than a lot of other shows that I've been on because usually you pick a camera rig and you build a workflow around a camera rig. In the case of Invisible, we're working with Jaunt and Samsung and uh, 30 Ninjas, which is Doug Lyman's company. And so we've basically arrived at about six different camera rigs. And that enables us to shoot all kinds of interesting, creative, different shots. But yet again, it creates a whole post-production problem where we're going nuts trying to keep track of which rig is working, which one's not. Can we mix the rigs? Can we shoot? Uh, back plates with one and shoot the shot with the other. So these are all, I, I kind of foresaw that that was coming and I, I did everything I could to make sure that we embed, uh, embed clean plates into every single shot. So for instance, in this, in this shot, we would, obviously, you guys have worked in lat long, right? I mean, you can, you can read this, you can have to have an eye for it, obviously, but this, this thing on the bottom, are rails, that's actually a straight line. There's an apple box with, with uh, sandbags on it. And then this particular rig is a 220 degree um, three camera, three GoPro rig, which is great because it stitches really well. Color, gen lock, all these things are always questions, but it allows us to have a, a relatively small uh, dolly rig on the floor and to move the camera fairly quickly, as opposed to, for instance, the jaunt camera, which is heavy, I think it's 25 pounds, something like that. Um, you don't want to move it very quickly and you don't want things to be, you know, it has a much larger footprint. It's about the size of a basketball. This, this little rig that we're shooting on here is smaller than a baseball, all towed, right? So you have uh, very little parallax and very lightweight, with the downside being it's GoPro and I'm not going to go on that tirade, but <laughs> you know what I mean. Uh, so at the head and tail of every shot, I would embed a clean plate so that, so that in post we're not chasing around all the additional chunks of footage. So that I know if I put it into auto pano, for instance, and get a daily stitch, and you know, you do 10 takes of this, so it's not trivial to say, oh, just find the back plate for that. Because it's, if the camera doesn't start and stop at the same spot on each one, then you've got to find a different plate or you've got to modify it and paint it differently. It just becomes an administrative nightmare, which is why I bring up this. Yes. How do you budget for this was the question she asked. Um, well, at this point, because we've done so much stitching, then we, we, actually, we actually budget stitching on a per minute basis with qualifiers. Is it mono? Is it stereo? Is it... Uh, 20 cameras or three cameras. So we have we've worked out kind of a pricing grid, but but you raise a good point because again I, you see I still haven't even gotten to the end yet, right? There's still a whole bunch more steps on a per shot basis. So the you know the big surprising thing is how much the proportions of work 
shift around, even though every single step of it, plus or minus with plugins or a viewer or this or that, every other step is exactly the same as everything else we do in visual effects. Like, there's not a lot of surprises there other than you know, how difficult it can be to get in and out of spherical space with maintaining quality um, and arriving at a final shot. Um, so the budgeting, I mean, there's not a clean multiplier on it. It's just a, a conception. It's just like, if you thought it was this with a beginning and end, now multiply that by four just right off the bat. Or consider, for instance, um, you know, like at our shop, we'll have kind of one producer per every five or six artists for, for um, visual effects. Or one, one producer, one comp supervisor, five or six artists. And you can do a lot of work with that with that team. But for VR, it's actually different. You need probably a producer. You need someone that's acting like an editor, like an assistant editor, like a, like a conform, uh, whatever you call that guy, kind of a DI conform type person. Um, because after you've done, I mean, I mean, just to stay on this thread for a second, when you're shooting at 60 frames a second, you have 3,600 frames per minute, right? So 3,600 frames per minute times pick a number, 10 cameras, so that's 36,000 frames per minute that have to come in to create 3,600 frames to go out. And that's on a 10 camera rig, which isn't <coughs> even, I don't even know of a 10 camera rig. Um, it's just for example. Um, so in that scenario, especially rendering at 4K or even larger, because a lot of times um, they were mentioning filter hits, which, which is a consistent problem that we have and everybody has really, because uh, a spherical to a rectilinear transformation is, is possibly one of the most destructive types of, of filter operations you can do on uh, rasterized data, right? You're, you've, got, you've got this stuff at the bottom that's curving out, and then you're trying to apply a, a rasterized, a pixelated grid against it. So you've got these two things grading against each other, and, a fi and a, some kind of biocubic filter is trying to do its best to interpolate between them. But, but spatially, one pixel is not equal to another, right? So it's, it's a terrible problem. So a lot of times we'll, you know, for shooting on GoPros or Dragons or whatever, we'll go ahead and have an intermediate moment in the comp that's 20 or 30K, even if the intention is to deliver it at 4K by 2K. And that's just to alleviate the complexity of, of trying to unwrap transforms and maintain clean filters and all that. And administ admittedly, that's not really the cleanest solution in the world. But when you have the larger workflow which says, I need a producer, I need an editor, I need one guy who's kind of setting up the master stitch, I need five roto artists who are picking up little edges here, I need a render wrangler who's constantly watching it. And that's probably two jobs because, you know, when you put 36,000 frames, well, I'm saying 36,000 in and it's five minutes long, all of a sudden now what are we at? almost 20,000 frames that have to come out. With a 20K requirement somewhere in the middle, um, your farm's probably gonna have a hard time. You're gonna all of a sudden have different questions about what resources you have available and how quickly you can actually deliver that as a final product. So, um, so yeah, it's a thing. You probably need an extra guy, like a night guy, who you may not, may or may not normally have, but just, just monitoring renders and making sure things come out. And, and in fact, checking frames as they come off the farm, as opposed to maybe a more conventional setup where um, you wait for the shot to render and then you look at the shot. But when it's a, you know, a nine hour render for just the frame sequence and potentially a five hour render just to make a quick time afterwards, like you want to catch bugs as early on in the process as possible. So let me see if I can just pull up some of these other images. Um, do you guys want to hear about a camera rig that I'm working on, or do you want to? Yeah. Okay. Camera rigs. Yes. Affordable camera rig. It's gonna be. You'll see. I mean, I'm curious, you know, and we'll all talk afterwards. But um, so we found this type of model, which is different than almost anything I've seen. This is. Oh, why is it slide showing? Stop. Okay, so this is, there, there's lots of different models of this. This is one called Pano Pro, um, which is, I, I, I'm gonna use the word parabolic. It's actually not a parabola, and that's when, when I say we're designing a lens. Um, there are minor details that we're changing from, from a variety of existing rigs that are already out there, 
and uh, and we can step through them because I think it's interesting. It's like if we can, for instance, uh, put a, a a dragon on this side or a weapon that she would AK, and then you can work out uh, proper focus and proper sizing and depth of field on this side, then all of a sudden you may have a viable solution where. Okay, it's an 8K frame, but it's only one frame. You're not assembling cameras anymore, right? And it's a file that has one name instead of 10 random names coming from some auto-generated thing somewhere. Um, Real-time onset preview, right? All of a sudden, is much easier to, to downsample a, a, an 8K or a 6K or a, a 4K frame. And if you can get it into any kind of like WebGL compliant renderer or any other like, like it becomes very cheap where you've got an easy way to redistribute live playback on set, which ultimately does affect your budget because what we're finding with, uh, with Invisible, for instance, is that a lot of times the director either has to go sit in a closet and wait to see when the shot seems to be over and then jump back onto the shot or onto the set, right? Or uh, we're using the, the Ricoh Theta, which is a great little device for what it is. It's not the best image quality in the world, but it's wireless, it's fast, it's HD, it's small, you can duct tape it to your camera. So in, in our rig, actually, we have a jaunt camera with a Theta camera with possibly a GoPro camera all doing a whole wireless mess of things all around just so that, just so that the crew knows more about what's going on than what you get with really almost any other rig um, without a very complicated <laughs> setup, you know. Um, like, I think that, that, for instance, the mill, like what you guys did, that's amazing. Um, that's and I say I'm coming at it from the other way in the sense of like well I don't know how you shoot on location with it and I don't know like and that's what everyone's kind of asking and that's what we're trying to answer to is how do you go on location how do you do a smaller run and gun shoot like parts of these are, are unanswered and, and, and we're trying to solve it uh, in its own way so this is this is kind of part of the idea is to create as, as much as possible a single cam single camera system um, this is the resulting image. We shot this in Washington Square Park in New York. Um, it's interesting because it suffers a lot of similar but different bugs as the lat long format itself, right? You've got uh, a very uneven distribution uh, across the, the, I don't even know how you'd call that. I guess radial distribution is weird, where the bottom of your image, if, if this is shot on a, on a 4K frame, the inside of your image there calculates out to be about 300 pixels around in, in circumference. The outer one, however, uh, comes out at about uh, something like 3.5K, 4K. Assuming it's, you know, you're shooting on, for instance, uh, a 4K by 2K frame or Ultra HD frame, you end up with around 3K, uh, well, whatever it is, math while I'm on stage, 2K times pi. So that's 6K, but you may downsample it, and you lose some to the additional. Um, uh, what's happening is that the, the outer ring of that is actually falling out of the, is, is smaller than the field of view. So um, generally, you gain more light on a prime lens. So therefore, if we try to shoot with a prime lens, you may get more focus on a prime lens. But obviously, prime lens, you don't get the opportunity to, uh, to turn your zoom ring. So there's always that bit of inaccuracy there. Um, so this is one idea of a design that we're coming to, um, just interesting factoids like, uh, interesting factoids like th this, we're not the first ones to invent this and we're adding our own parts to it, uh, in the process of trying to develop it. We've actually been kind of looking through old patents and things like that. Um, it turns out that this type of thing has been around for like 100, 150 years in, in different types of forms like camera obscuras and things like that. Uh, it's pretty cool. One very interesting thing is just how much it's used in space travel and like the Mars rover, for instance, where this, this cup can push out. The Mars rover can look around in every direction but only deal with one camera lens. Computer vision can eat up all that data without having to do all kinds of assembly and weird data stream stuff. And then if a sandstorm comes or there's any other problem, they can just close it down and be protected. So it's kind of an interesting design because you know a lot of times you're, you're not able to be as careful as you would like when you're on location for a shoot. Like it would be easier to take this underwater for a shoot, for instance, than to take five dragon cameras in a cubic yard of like plexiglass or something. So, 
So it affords a lot of interesting possibilities that are, that are uh, going to produce uh, a better environment for post-production and for storytelling. Um, I could babble all day, so I just want to stop and say, do, does anyone have questions? Or we've got about three minutes left. I hope to. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not holding back. I want I mean it's it's an idea. It's not I don't know if anybody's ever going to get rich, but it's an interesting idea that goes uh almost counter to a lot of the other camera designs that are coming out where it's I've seen camera oops, I've seen rigs with like 40 cameras in all different configurations, larger than a basketball, different inter interchangeable lenses, like all kinds of stuff and it's like, well, here's an idea that goes in the opposite direction. Uh yes. If you are designing this, why are you designing it based off the fact that there's already cameras out there? Like, what do you see that's wrong with those, and, and why are you re-engineering it? And uh, also in that question, where are you setting your focus on the uh, mirror? The, the reason that we're redesigning it, and this is, I mean, I'm giving you a little secret, but not really, because it is still difficult to, to figure out anyway. This particular design is kind of like a prosumer model, and I look at it, and I'm like, it's perfect. Why is it not the prevalent model? Like, why is it not what all cameras are designed after at this point? Because it just seems simpler. Okay, we've got to shoot a little part to plug on top, but then I'm only at two cameras. You just shoot something on the floor, but theoretically that's just a ground plate. Okay. If, why is it that this simpler design is not the prevalent one? This is like my thought process. So we started getting into it, and it turns out that usually it's used with still cameras. Still cameras, obviously, you can shoot with a long shutter. Uh, you can adjust your depth of field because of that, and you can adjust ISO. Great. Okay. Well, that means that if, if from my SLR to the end of that lens, let's just say it takes six or seven inches to clear the barrel, and you get another four or five inches before you get to the mirror element, well, then that means that this lens has to hold focus at 12 inches and have a depth of field of four inches against 12 inches, which is a lot to ask of any lens, and it doesn't even necessarily really exist, or certainly not in a robust way. It might be a very, very specialized lens that you would have to find, which we haven't been able to find yet. Um, what we're actually doing is keeping, keeping something similar to that, retrofitting the, the base to, to be compatible with other mounts, and we're actually building a, an aspherical lens element. We're having it actually manufactured that acts as, um, like a good analogy would be like a contact lens, right? That, that without significantly shifting the, the size or shape, it actually shifts uh, focal point and depth of field so that it becomes more trivial to maintain four inches of depth of field against 12 inches. So that's a kind of an expensive element to make. And for the prosumer market, that doesn't make any sense. So, so we're, we're not exactly reinventing it. It's just taking this line of thought and repurposing it for something that's going to run at 48 or 60 frames a second, that's going to run on very, very high resolution gla uh, sensors. So for instance, if you want to shoot this on a, on a dragon, we're going to have to refactor the mirror element and, and create highly reflective material that probably costs 10 or 20 <coughs> times as much as this, this element as it stands now. So <coughs> did I miss others? Yes. So one of the cameras you might want to look at is um, something I referred to earlier, the Oxbury multiplane animation camera. Mm -hmm. That's how we originally did visual effects back in optical days before computers. Mm -hmm. um, and the reason why it's so interesting is because you have a still a camera that's still in place, but it has multiple planes that all move independently, and you're able to calculate the depth of field. Um, and the distortion per level, mm -hmm. but it, it only, it, like I said, it's an actual fixed camera with a fixed lens, but we used to have to calculate frame by frame, level by level, the depth of field and the parallax per frame. So it's a very interesting camera. Okay, okay. Oxbury. It's my Oxbury Multiplane. When I hear Oxbury, I think optical printer. No, it's an uh, Oxbury Multiplane and <coughs> camera. Okay. Okay. Awesome. One on display in San Francisco. Okay. But that's. Disney has one in the print as well. What's that? Disney. Yeah, Yeah, the Frankie Wells building. But that's what I really like about VR. Is like it's it it's it's this really cool invitation to visit things that have already existed and maybe 
freshen them or change them. Like so much technology already exists that we're just not, you know, it's kind of like forgotten or has become obsolete in one context, but now we have a new context and all of a sudden, sudden interesting things can happen. I'm running very short on time, but I won't uh, just. Um, have you, how big of an issue is the optical compression you get in the mirror? As you obviously, like some things are more compressed than others through the, the mirror. Do you find that being an issue at all? Or? It's a huge issue. Because you're, you're trying to do a, a nonlinear bicubic resample of a, of a parabolically distorted element into um, a lat long space. And, you know, similar to like color transforms, it's like, where do you do the filtering? Where do you do the, the, the scale up? Or if you're going to do a sharpen, or when you add grain or remove grain, like all those steps and the sequencing is, is very critical. And it's something that we are. Um, we're refining every day. We have it working really well. Um, we're just trying to wait for new versions of our contact lens. It's like updating one piece of the system makes it a whole new system. So it's like a new process every time. Um, I think that's all I have time for today. So once again, we'd like to thank our uh, all our speakers for today, and uh, you know, gave some great presentations. And uh, you're free to talk to them down here. I believe most of them will be outside with the tables, along with the HP uh, raffle and a few other demos going on outside. So thank you very much.